Welcome back to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist, and our guest this weekend is Bill Bonner, who's perhaps best known for founding, way back in the 1970s, Agora Financial, which in the intervening decades has turned into a publishing juggernaut. Now, Bill has spent his career living and traveling around the world to understand global markets, and he's an absolute expert on central banking and debt. As a matter of fact, he wrote the book on it called Empire of Debt way back in 2005, which later became a documentary movie. So Bill and I have a great conversation about this sort of bizarro world of debt and fed machinations that we find ourselves living in today. Now, one quick caveat, we caught Bill on a cell phone from one of his second homes in Paris, France, and so the sound quality is not optimal, but we think you'll enjoy this interview anyway. So stay tuned for a great conversation with Bill Bonner from Agora Financial. Hard to believe, but it's been 10 years, roughly, since Empire of Debt was written, and I remember Addison Wigan coming down to Washington, D.C., meeting with Ron Paul and talking about the book. And Ron ultimately ended up, I believe, in the documentary movie about the book. Could you have imagined at that time when you wrote it, everything that would have happened since, you know, the Lehman Brothers crash of 2008 and, and the Fed's reaction and quantitative easing? It, it's, it almost sounds quaint now, but uh, at about that time when the book came out, uh, total federal debt was $8 trillion. Of course, now it's about $18 trillion. So it's really it's been an amazing ride. It has been an amazing ride. No, I, I have been, I have been wrong, consistently wrong. I'd like to say that I'm consistent. I'm consistently wrong for the last forty years, because I remember talking to Murray Rothbard back in like 1973, <laughs> and we were sitting around. You know, at the time, I didn't really know what was going on, but he said, "Well, this can't last. You know, this can't last." <laughs> Because they had just set up this new currency system, they eliminated the international the international exchangeability, you know, the dollar. But previous to 1971, you could change your money into the foreigners could take their money to the U.S. and change the gold. So when when we had a pure paper money system, uh, nobody, you know, I didn't think it would last for more than a few years, and. Uh, here we are, 40 years later, and still still going. I wouldn't say it's going strong, but it's still going. No, it is amazing. And and when you think about it, there's, there are millions of people working in in financial markets and financial industries and Wall Street and private equity funds, et cetera, who, who don't even re- remember the Greenspan era, much less Paul Volcker, right? I mean, 1973 might as well be 1873. No, uh, exactly right. I mean, it's amazing what's happened. And it's happened over such a long period of time that uh, most people, I don't know, most people alive today, or at least most people who are making important decisions in the financial world, have no experience of anything other than a bull market, because we had a bull market since 1982, and no experience of real money, because we haven't had that since 1971 or 1968 domestically. So this has been a very, very strange period in history, one that had that shouldn't exist the way it does. It, it theoretically, mathematically, can't go on for much longer, but it's gone on. It's improved remarkably robust and remarkably durable. And uh, part of the reason, of course, is that so many people can't imagine anything else. And they can't imagine that anything could go very wrong with it. Yes, they, now they've lived through the crisis of 2008, 2009, so they know there are there are setbacks, and now they're puzzled about why the economy hasn't rebounded, but uh, they assume that it's just a matter of time until the authorities get their ducks lined up and everything will work well again. Well, you wrote in an article a week or two back that uh, Yellen's announcement last week, which turned out to be an announcement that the Fed was not going to do anything, um, was the most anticipated central bank action in history. I mean, isn't this kind of bizarre? Have you, can you ever recall, the, the now I won't say the general public, but certainly the financial press being this fixated on a central bank action? It's, it almost seems bizarre to me. Well, it's totally bizarre. And it's bizarre because it never before made so much difference that the, the Fed, I mean, central banks, up until recently, up until, you know, until Greenspan, I think Greenspan was the, the decisive pivot in the whole central banking world. Up until him, nobody knew the names of a central banker. And, the, you know, the, the, you can take that all the way back to the, the head of the mint in, in England in the 11th century. Nobody knew who these people were because they were supposed to not do anything. 
their role was just to not do anything, to not <laughs> not to use any innovative techniques, not to use imagination, not to come up with new plans, not to pull on levers, not to turn knobs. Their job was simply to make sure they didn't do anything that would ruin the, the, the monetary stability of the country. Now we have all these innovators, these activists, these people with ideas, and it's amazing. I read the paper every day, and the new economists coming up with new ideas for how they can fix the new knob or turn a new new thing there. But it, 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 it's amazing. Now we're just innovating. We're, we're improvising. We're making it up as we go along. And that's not something you're supposed to do in central banking. But now that we are, everybody dies and turn to the central bank because they're going to do something. Nobody knows what they're going to do. They don't know what they're going to do. But they're making this up as they go along. And it's sure to be a disaster because that's not the way central banking is supposed to work. Well, when you talk about making it up as they go along, everybody who thinks like we do surmises that there's going to be some kind of end game to all this debt. There's going to be some sort of global currency reset. So Jim Rickards in his newsletter recently said something I thought was so interesting. He's talking about decisions that are being made by elites that are going to impact global capital markets. And he says this, I'm, I'm quoting him. He says, they do not announce radical changes overnight. They prefer to make small moves year after year through boring technical changes that few notice or understand. And I'd like to get your thought on this because we tend to think that there's going to be some big calamity or there's going to be another Bretton Woods type uh, summit or the IMF is going to do something very publicly and SDRs are going to come to the fore. But in fact, maybe this is just happening and we're not aware of it because it's it's happening through through, as Rickard says, sort of small technical changes. Well, yes, I think they're making small changes all the time because they dare not make big ones. They don't know. They, they, really, I think they're given far too much credit. When I read what they have done or what they say, you, you know, you hope they're like politicians and you hope that behind the stuff that they say publicly, they have some private thoughts that make some sense. But I doubt if it's true. You know, they, they, they have done a lot of work, spent their whole lives doing mostly academic kind of work in, uh, in economics. But that academic, uh, school that they're in it just doesn't make any sense in the end of the, at the end of the day. So they don't really have a, a firm idea of what they're doing or how they're going to do it. They really are improvising. And the impro improvising now is taking place by little increments because they don't really trust what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They kind of wait to see what happens. But when the whole thing falls apart, which it will, then they will improvise on a much, much grander scale. And then we'll get some, I think what we'll get is, first they'll make cash illegal, which are probably at the depths of the next crisis. And then we'll see some much more heavy-handed uh, innovation. Well, the idea that they don't know what they're doing, surely that uncertainty is not priced into markets today. Would you agree that, that markets today reflect uh, at least a subconscious belief that somewhere someone has their hand on the wheel and they know what the hell they're doing? Well, yeah, I think so. It, it's, it may not be that they know what they're doing, but maybe a lot of people think they don't need to know what they're doing, that, that the system works well and just as long as they don't muck it up too badly, it'll be fine. But uh, but what's happened is that they have their, this activism of the Fed requires them to know what they're doing, and at least in a theoretical way, it requires them to know things that they couldn't possibly know anyway. So it, it's it's really hopeless, and eventually it'll become hope, become clear to just just about everybody that it doesn't work. You know, when we get a few days of stock market sell off, it really won't take very much. Get a few days, a thousand points down day after day for a few days, and everybody is going to look at Janet Yellen and the Fed <laughs> and say, what are you doing? What has gone wrong? Why didn't we stop this? And then, of course, they'll come out with some new program. But what's different here as opposed to, let's say, Argentina in 99, 2000, yeah, I know you've spent a lot of time down there, is that we're talking about people tinkering with the world's reserve currency. We've never had a, a a, a collapse of a worldwide reserve currency. I mean, this is uncharted territory. No, it's totally uncharted. No, Argentina was small potatoes, small potatoes. And Argentina also is full of Argentines. 
the Argentines are very different from Americans in that they already suspected that the system didn't work. Nobody in Argentina trusted the central bank. It was only the foreign the foreign lenders who thought that they were telling the, the truth. But uh, the Argentines themselves, you know, they have big wads of cash in their pockets. They have they don't they don't save money in banks. They typically if they're going to try to preserve some wealth in Argentina, they buy an apartment or buy a farm or something. I mean, they are used to this kind of stuff, so they knew what they were doing. But on the world stage as a whole, the, the U.S. the reserve currency, the United States dollar, that nothing like this has ever happened, and it is you know many many times the scale. Not to mention the fact that in in America today, there are few people who are prepared for any kind of monetary disaster. I mean, there are people who walk around with no money in their pockets. They have a credit card or a line of credit, and they go to an ATM machine, get some cash that they need to spend, but they're not at all prepared for the kind of disaster that's headed their way. Well, if you had to tell the average guy or gal one thing they should do today, you know, a person of, of ordinary means, an, an American, let's say, um, what what would you say? What would you say that an average person could do to protect themselves, even if what we're talking about is a remote or outside possibility? Well, it's very easy and it doesn't really cost anything. Just make sure you have some cash. Cash is going to be you know, where the rubber meets the road in the next crisis. And the ATM machines are not going to work. So you got to make sure you have some cash on hand just to pay for ordinary living expenses during this crisis period. And of course, nobody knows how it'll work or how long it'll take. But the other thing you should have is some gold coins, just simple, simple bullion coins. You should have some of your savings in bullion coins because they tend to resist the crisis and all sorts. And the crisis could come in many different forms, and nobody knows. There's lots of argument about whether it'll be just a pure classic deflation or a hyperinflation or just high levels of inflation sustained over many years. Nobody knows, and you can't know those things. But we do know that over time, gold coins, just simple bullion coins, tend to hold their value. And so when you you go through a crisis, and a crisis could take a year, it could take five years, it could take 10 years, but you come out of it, and you still got the gold coins, you hope, and they're still worth something. Whereas your bonds, stocks, and everything else, paper assets, they may or may not be worth something. Well, what about the idea that a little bit of something can be good and a lot of something can be bad, like alcohol, for instance? Um, you know, Marx, I'm sure this is misquoting him, but it's paraphrasing Marx that somehow as we get too rich and too prosperous, we're going to hang ourselves on our own luxury vices. Um, is this something, as a person who's traveled a lot, who's studied a lot of other economies, are Americans just really dumb and really clueless about what makes us rich and, and what it's going to take to sustain this? Uh, well, the, you know, this idea of hormesis is this phenomenon that people have observed in in medicine where you give a little dose of something to somebody it makes them better and you give a big dose and they die. But uh, that, that's the fundamental idea of uh, of that book, which is that public policy works the same way, that a, a public policy, and not just public policy, but something like government. You can argue that a little bit of government it really is a good thing because it kind of stabilizes things and it makes it easier for people to make long-term uh, plans and so on. But a lot of government, and you reach that point very fast, by the way, <laughs> a lot of government is, is obviously not a good thing because then the instability increases. The more government you have, the more people you have making decisions, the more people you have making decisions that affect your life. And so now you can't make a decision because somebody else is making a decision that runs right into it. But that phenomenon is a phenomenon that we see in almost everything where a little bit of something can be good, a lot of it tends to be disastrous. And uh, in the financial world, that's the, the idea of that book really is that in the financial world we have a policy, a public policy, and the public policy is this kind of Keynesian manipulation of the economy in order to provide more what they call aggregate demand. The aggregate demand means just printing money, basically just printing money. So the person goes, takes the money, goes into a store, he has demand, he buys something. And there's a whole generation, maybe two generations of economists who believe that this is the way to improve an economy. 
where in fact there's no evidence whatever that any economist has ever improved any economy. I mean, it's just not, it's not true. And while a little bit of aggregate, a little bit of extra aggregate demand or a little bit of credit, a little bit of even money printing might stimulate the economy in some way, it is certainly true that you put a lot of this stuff to work and then you get a lot of people who depend on it. And those people then insist on more of it because they need it in order to sustain the kind of advantages and benefits and actually the property that they've come to, to, to acquire. So when you get more and more people in support of a policy like that, you necessarily get more and more of that policy, and then you get so many people in favor of the policy that it's unstoppable. And then it has to run its course to the inevitable destruction, to Formageddon, to the point where it all blows up and just can't go on anymore. And that's where I think our public financial policies are headed. Bill Bonner, thanks so much for your time today and a really fascinating interview. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.